drive down a country road at night where something strange awaits you in the dark. Regret not taking intermediate Spanish when a chatty ghost seeks your help. Alter your expectations when your wife with a kiss turns out to be neither. All this and more weird history, strange science, and the paranormal. It's entirely true. It's submitted by you. It's a brand new Parlor Stories edition of Odd Tonic. Welcome to the parlor. I'm Jennifer. And I'm Maxwell. Please come in from the lion's roar of early spring, dear guest, and warm yourself by the fire with a hot cup of tea. I am so glad winter is near its end and we're looking towards warmer days in the weeks to come. It just always makes me so happy. (laughs) And I'm very happy to share that tonight is a very special evening as it's Odd Tonic's first year anniversary. Yes, happy (laughs) anniversary, love. Happy anniversary to you, my love. (laughs) And to you, dear guest. Thank you for your visits and support all year. And we have another full season of frights, perplexities, and strangeness in store for you. And you can be sure there'll be some wonderfully odd surprises along the way. That's right. But before we completely close the book on Odd Tonic's first year and add it to the parlor shelf, (laughs) I think we should just take a moment to reflect on the wonderful community that has built itself around the show. (laughs) Nearly 26,000 people now follow our Facebook page, and over 7,000 are part of our excellent close-knit Facebook group. (laughs) It's just amazing. (laughs) It was our goal from the start to create a very special place where our fellow oddlings could gather and be curious, devilishly dark and deliciously left of center. (laughs) And we are overjoyed by the kind, witty souls that have helped make it a reality. I can't express enough how amazing it's been to become friends with so many interesting people. Please know that you are dear to our hearts. Yeah, it's really been such a pleasure to meet them. Mm. And in addition to the fantastic articles, artwork, and crazy memes they've contributed, (laughs) our fellow oddlings have also been brave and generous enough to share with us experiences from their own lives, things they generally don't confide in others, true stories of strange and uncanny occurrences that defy an easy explanation. Stories of hauntings, time slips, cryptids. Why do they share these with us? Because we believe you. Every few shows, we gather the stories people have sent in, and like tonight, we share them in a special Odd Tonic episode called Parlor Stories. Do you have a story? We would love to hear it. Email it to theparlor at oddtonicsociety.com. In honor of our anniversary, we're going to check back in with three people whose stories we shared in the past year for updates Mm. and for more unsettling, true experiences. Are you ready? Me? After all this time, I still wake up spooky. Let's do this. (laughs) All right, dear guest. We hope you are ready, too. You might remember Rick from the Monster in the Ether edition of Parlor Stories. More like, you might remember Rick because you're still emotionally scarred from the Monster <laughs> in the Ether edition of Parlor Stories. Yeah, it's uh, one of the scariest batch of tales we've ever shared. If you haven't listened to Monster in the Ether, be sure to cue it up after this show. Yeah. You will not be disappointed. Rick's tales were so unnerving, they inspired us to devote the next episode entirely to sleep paralysis, a condition that he's terribly afflicted by among other terrors. <laughs> when we caught up with Rick, he had this ominous update for us. Good evening, oddlings. Rick here again. I just wanted to share an event that happened in February that was quite creepy and worthy of retelling. 
Just before Christmas, I was suffering from increased migraines and followed up with my doctor. I brought up some of my other symptoms, including my auditorial, tactile, and visual hallucinations, sleep paralysis, and daytime sleepiness to help paint a broader picture and hopefully get some reprieve, or at least answers as to why I was getting these migraines. I ended up filling almost every checkbox for narcolepsy. I had suspicions that I might have had narcolepsy because I have so many of the same symptoms. So now I was nervous that an official diagnosis of being narcoleptic would lead to losing my driver's license and have career implications. Being military and attempting to get into medicine, this would blast my future plans. I had a pretty big slump in my mood and was worried about my family's future. Luckily, after receiving a CT scan which showed I had no tumors and an MRI showing that I had no previous signs of stroke or other brain deformities, I took my sleep test, which also came back clear. This was great, and my mood ramped right back up. So, I did not have narcolepsy, even though I heard noises, and saw things in my room. Fast forward to February. I'm taking a midday nap in my bedroom. I hear someone open the door and walk to the bed beside me. Oh, nice. My wife is coming in to say hi, I think to myself. I feel the bed depressed by my face as my wife leans over the bed to kiss me. I feel her breath warm on my face, and I open my eyes. The room is empty, and my door is still shut. Well, that hasn't happened for a little while, but stuff like this has happened so often in the past that it doesn't creep me out anymore. I wasn't going to let this get in the way of me and some good shut-eye, so I figured I should just try to go back to sleep. When I did, I almost instantly had a sleep paralysis attack. This doesn't happen at all during the day and almost never when I'm on my side. Then, a very familiar voice called from the ether. Hey. I fought to gain control of my body and after some effort, I did. Like you may have, I recognized the voice too. But knowing that the moment was over, and still being extremely tired, I figured I'd just try to nap again and refresh. As I began to fall off into sleep, again I felt a creeping feeling up the back of my neck as if grasped by a hand, and suddenly, full paralysis again. After what felt like minutes, I heard a girl's voice speak in a very sarcastic and cold tone into my ear. Don't worry, you are never alone. I wrestled to gain control, only to feel my head get turned to the side and pushed down by the unseen hands. I am always here, watching you. (sighs) All right, um, I'll be right back, love. <laughs> Don't leave me in here with this by myself. <laughs> All right, I'm back. Um, what I miss? <laughs> I just can't believe your life, Rick. That, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, wow, wow. And of course, you'll get the full meaning of the voice that says "Hey" when you listen to Monster <laughs> in the Ether. Yeah, and you know what? There is another detail to Rick's story that he left out, but he mentioned to us. Mm. He thought its inclusion would be anticlimactic, but I think it sheds some light into his life and general stamina. <laughs> he said that after this happened, he completely laughed it off 
and went back to sleep for an uninterrupted 30 minutes. Can you believe that? Right. That's how acclimated he is to these nightmarish things that would send any of us <laughs> leaping out of bed and through the nearest window. That you just clearly demonstrated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Show us how it's done, Maxwell. <laughs> no, I really feel for Rick. It's yeah. been quite the odyssey that he's gone through. He sought help for his migraines and nightly terrors, was told he probably had narcolepsy, which he worried about for over months. Yeah. And then he was told he was fine, but he's still left with what he came in with, migraines yeah. and nightly terrors. Yeah, you're right. uh, my heart just goes out to him. Yeah. If there are any oddlings out there with <laughs> an advanced degree in odd, <laughs> and you think you may have a proven solution for sleep paralysis and all its exciting add-ons. And migraines. <laughs> and migraines. Send us a note to theparlor at oddtonicsociety.com. Either spelling of parlor is fine. Mm -hmm. And we'll be sure to get them to Rick. In the meantime, Rick, you're my hero. <laughs> Now, last year, you may remember a Parlor Stories episode called Haunted Birthday Edition, where Christopher told of a very scary haunting in a basement apartment in an old run-down building in Denver, Colorado. He mentioned that he and his wife were no strangers to the paranormal. <laughs> and brother, you can say that again. Christopher is back with another experience, and... Hold on to your hat, dear guest. This one will leave you thinking. I have another story for you from the list of many experiences that my wife and I have shared over the years. This one is a bit personal, and I still carry a lot of regret for some of the things that happened. However, it's a wonderful cautionary tale for those trying to protect themselves from spirits. After telling the story, I'd also like to talk more about that as well. This one starts a bit after the last story, when we were living in that haunted apartment in downtown Denver. By this time, we were living in our condo in Denver, and my wife was working in a theater. We would often spend the night socializing after shows with actors and crew with food and drink at the many restaurants and bars near the theater. One night, we were out late after a show with friends at a bar located within the theater complex. While we were certainly imbibed, it was no more than normal, and we were young and could take it. My wife came back from the bathroom and pulled me aside. She said... She saw an odd person come into the bathroom while she was cleaning up, and it creeped her out, so she wanted to leave. She described the person as a young woman who was very beautiful and was wearing some sort of costume, but she couldn't tell what show she would have been in. It was a period costume, like something a historic voodoo queen would wear. In fact, she described her as looking somewhat like Marie Laveau of New Orleans fame. My wife was creeped out by this person because she stared at her via the mirror without blinking or moving. It gave her the heebie-jeebies, so we left the bar. Before we go forward with this story, I need to explain something about my past. And while this would constitute an entirely different letter, it's worth mentioning to help explain how I handled what happened next. Growing up, especially in my high school years, I was rather accustomed to seeing spirits as a matter of routine. Certain events happened toward the end of high school that caused me to forcibly shut down that part of myself, and I haven't been able to see much since, with some notable exceptions. I have often regretted turning off that part of my brain or consciousness or whatever it was I did, but I still do have some instincts and a higher sight that I've honed over the years. Anyway, it was not all that unusual during my high school years for spirits to come into my consciousness and replay experiences they wanted me to see. It happened enough that my friends and I used to call it tweaking out and they knew how to handle me when I fell into that state. It wasn't a possession or anything uncomfortable like that. It was just like 
seeing a scene played over the real world. At worst, I'd be highly distracted, like an intense state of daydreaming. I had also witnessed others tweak out and, in fact, recognize similar behavior with some mediums I've met or seen on TV, although, of course, the experience is different for everyone. Well, I say all that because, for the first time in our marriage, I saw my wife tweak out. It was odd, but with her paranormal past, I wasn't too surprised. While walking home, she started to become confused, seemingly lost. At first, I thought maybe we'd gone a little overboard at the bar, but then I noticed she was acting rather sober and perfectly coherent. It then started getting weird. She began speaking in Spanish. Now, it's important to note that my wife doesn't know Spanish, or at least didn't at the time. During those years, I was somewhat familiar, although not fluent. Even with my familiarity of the language, however, I had a hard time understanding what she was trying to say. It was like Spanish, but not exactly. Then it occurred to me that she was also speaking French, or like a mix of the two languages, or maybe a strong French accent using Spanish with some French. By the time she got home, she was speaking entirely in this Spanish-French hybrid. I'd accepted that this was a tweak out and it was the spirit that was speaking. I tried to talk to her in the little Spanish I knew, but it was frustrating and I wasn't getting through. Her state was calm and conversational, but urgent and increasingly frustrated. She was trying to explain something to me that I just wasn't getting. I don't recall a lot of what she said, even when I did understand, she wasn't making a lot of sense. The night was getting late and I was very much starting to worry. In my experience, these sort of episodes didn't last very long, maybe an hour at most, but this had been going on for several hours. It started to sink in that there was this very real possibility, she was possessed. I'm not a religious person, so I didn't exactly panic. I also didn't think this was a demon or a spirit with malicious intent. She was trying to communicate and it wasn't working. But the longer it went on, the more I wondered if the spirit was going to leave. In my time of dealing with spirits, I learned a couple shortcuts that helped me in the past. One was using the pentagram as a banishing tool. All these years later and many decades of studying various aspects of Western mysticism, I can confirm that it is a powerful tool for that. However, it could also be a weapon. And if one doesn't use it in a positive way, the results can be dangerous and unpredictable. I had used the pentagram before in high school, and even as a kid, I recognized that it should only be used as a last resort. You see, I wasn't just using the pentagram, I was inverting it. I was consciously using a tool of black magic. I felt like I had no recourse. It was the early hours of the morning and my wife had been speaking in tongues for the better part of the night. She showed no signs of stopping. It wasn't like I could call a priest or a shaman. I didn't even know where to find one. So I did it. I traced the inverted pentagram on her forehead. She immediately fell limp and sweat began pouring from her. Her hands went clammy and she started shivering. My wife opened her eyes. She was scared, confused, and cold. She asked me, what happened? I explained that I'm pretty sure the woman in the bathroom was a spirit and that she had taken her over. She had no recollection of anything after the bathroom. As far as she was concerned, she passed out and woke up at home. She lost several hours, and she was freezing. Relieved the possession was over, I wrapped her in a blanket and held her, believing that the spell must have sapped her energy. But I was horribly wrong about that.
I like to say that many years passed without incident, but there were some odd things. My wife was fluent in Spanish now. As a teacher, she could talk confidently to Spanish-speaking students and parents. She knew every word that was spoken to her. However, if she tried to interpret it, she couldn't, and she couldn't read it. And the way she spoke it, it was always with this odd accent. Spanish speakers would often ask where she was from and comment that her dialect was different. One person even asked her if she was Creole. She's not. She's very Scottish. This went on for years and became commonplace for us. Fast forward 15 years. My wife was traveling in Boston on one of her writer's retreats. When in a city she's never been, she makes it a habit to go visit a psychic. She loves having card readings done and uses sessions for entertainment and maybe to help with personal growth. She met with a renowned psychic in Salem, where she was visiting. As a lover of all things witchy, it was the first place she went. I don't have a lot of the details of that session. She'd have to recount them. But what she told me after filled me with such horror and regret that I still struggle to get past it. The psychic observed that she had a dark shadow over her. This in itself wasn't unusual. She tends to attract spirits and, in fact, had an encounter in Boston before the reading. So she must have figured that the psychic was sensing all of the spirits around her. But this was different. The reading revealed that someone was attached to her. The psychic described the very same woman she saw in the bathroom all those years ago. The spirit had attached herself to my wife's back and was haunting her for 15 years. After my wife told me this, I was of course stunned, absolutely floored by the revelation. And what made matters worse, I realized what I had done. I strongly believe that the inverted pentagram seared the spirit to her, and after many years of studying the mysteries, I am certain that's what happened. As a young man, I didn't know what I was doing with this kind of work. I had lost my ability to see and interact with spirits years prior and was relying on a tool typically used to harm spirits. It filled me with deep sadness that through my recklessness and bravado, I caused this trauma. There was a lot about her anxiety and well-being that could likely be traced to this, not to mention what this must have done to the spirit. Over the years, I've studied several traditions, most notably Kabbalah, and also the Golden Dawn for a ceremonial practice. While these systems certainly have their flaws, they do have effective tools for keeping your own spirituality in control and can help to release bonds you've made. They also have tools for communicating with spirits in a safe way, safe for both you and the spirit. When my wife came home, I immediately used the academic methods I had learned over the years, and between the two of us, we worked on releasing the spirit. The tools worked. My wife felt an immediate release, like a disease had suddenly been cured and a massive weight was lifted. She was renewed years of this weight was suddenly released and in the few years since she has way more energy than ever and is healthier physically and emotionally than ever before i'm not sure that all of that can be traced to this haunting but i have no doubt that some of it can i wish i had a way to communicate with that spirit so i could apologize and perhaps so that i could hear what she was trying to say all those years ago. I know that a lot of listeners are open to the occult, the mysteries, and the esoteric. I would assume so, and I am as well. In fact, I'm an avid student. But I'd like to express my feelings about these tools when it comes to spirits and spirituality in general. First of all, they are tools. 
I do not believe in magic in the traditional sense. I believe that spells and rituals are ways of conditioning the mind to cause a certain result. They are, in short, forms of meditation. I think the specific spell, ritual, and symbol matters less than what those things mean to the practitioner. Symbols are very powerful because they shortcut the normal cognitive process and go straight to the lizard brain. In other words, you can understand something through a symbol without knowing it. In Kabbalah, they say that this is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is understanding by learning something. Wisdom is understanding without knowledge. However, I do not believe the symbols themselves have power. I think the inverted pentagram worked the way it did because of my intent. I wanted to harm the spirit and scare her away from my wife. I wanted to demonstrate my power over her. My bravado and reckless overconfidence is what attached the spirit to my wife, not the pentagram or the spell. So, whatever work you use, whether it be tarot, banishing rituals, smudging, meditation, or prayer, I think our most powerful magic is intent. A helpful hand is more powerful than a striking blow. If this were to happen today, I would clear a space of energy and distraction, and I would use something like tarot so the spirit can communicate without language, and I would try to help solve the problem. It's helpful to remember that most of the time, spirits are people too, and it's good to treat them that way. Unless, of course, when they aren't people at all. But that's a different story. <laughs> and a story we would love to hear, Christopher. Thank you. Yes. I love Christopher's refreshing take on the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. Ghosts, for the most part, are people who, yes. for whatever reason, have chosen not to cross over or, or don't realize that they're mm -hmm. dead. Mm -hmm. They're stuck. And if they're open to it, could use some assistance mm -hmm. from an experienced professional. You know, what they don't need is the toxic masculinity <laughs> that has crept into some ghost hunting shows over the last two years. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. The white guys who come charging in, <laughs> ripping off their shirts, going, come on, ghost! Come <laughs> scare me! I dare you! <laughs> Buddy, that, that helps nothing. No, no, you, it probably doesn't. <laughs> and, and you know what? On behalf of all the real ghost investigators out there, mm -hmm. You are an embarrassment to both the living and the dead. <laughs> well, it's just entertainment at that point. It's not any kind of right. serious. What? What? Or they what they think. Oh, they don't fake anything on those ghost <laughs> shows that are sponsored by companies who insist on some results. Result every episode. Right. No. Every every commercial every, break. <laughs> every single episode. What are the odds? <laughs> Okay, so Christopher's story makes me question further uh, something that pops in my head every once in a while about practices and rituals. His point that he did something without fully realizing the consequences of his intent, um, it makes me wonder about how many things we do that trigger results that we aren't aware of and that it doesn't matter if we had intent or not. Like, mm -hmm. does taking a shower wash away more negative energies than we realize? And does kissing your sick child's forehead deliver a small token of healing work? That sort of thing. Oh, because, because what you're saying is behind these actions are intent. Right? Or or even not. It could be intent. It could not be intent. Like the shower thing. Like you might not even be aware that you're your, the actions you're taking have intent, but some of them, like kissing your child, you are delivering a little, you know, a little piece of love there. So it mm -hmm. could go either way, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, and let's not forget, there is a scientific word for the documented positive results that come from intent and belief. Absolutely. It's called placebo, mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you know, the deeper we dive into the science of consciousness, the more we're going to be forced to address and reassess the power that can come from intent. Oh yeah, placebo to me is a very real thing and it unlocks something in the brain that allows you to do the work yourself. It's really, really fascinating. Right, exactly. And, and I think that we're really on the cusp of understanding and maybe starting to slightly admit that uh, a marriage between traditional Western medicine and the power that 
we have mm-hmm. through our consciousness is going to be the true path to yeah. to full healing full and, results and i'm i'm so looking forward yeah, to that i agree okay thank you christopher for this amazing story and the thoughts we that it provoked <laughs> yeah thank you so much well when we return we'll jump in the car and encounter something on the side of the road that will really get inside your head <laughs> literally <laughs> And we'll join Grandma in her kitchen, where she bakes cookies, raises bread, and raises the dead. (laughs) Don't draw an inverted pentagram just yet. (laughs) Odd Tonic will be right back. Hey, fellow oddlings, too busy to take a vacation right now? We've got just the ticket. It's a podcast called Your Haunted Holiday. Each week, twin sisters Lisa and Lindsay share their favorite haunted locations that you can actually visit, and they provide travel reviews, haunted history, and ghost stories from the different locations. Take a listen. Hi, everybody. This is Lisa. And I'm Lindsay. And we are identical twins who love to travel, but we are also completely obsessed with ghosts. That's right. So each week, we're going to bring you a new location, including the scary history of the place, uh, along with some ghost stories that are experienced at each location that you have access to go to and our travel reviews. So if you want to go on your own haunted travels or just live vicariously through us on our podcast, please come join us each week. Yeah, new episodes of Your Haunted Holiday are updated every Sunday, and you are sure to get a few laughs from our misadventures and fleeing from hotels at night, as well as learn a bit of history, and definitely you're going to get a little bit of a scare. And now it's time for one of our favorite moments on Odd Tonic, when we get to thank the Patreon donors who contribute monthly to our podcast's methods and madness. <laughs> Odd Tonic is an independent, listener-supported show. So by supporting us on Patreon, you absolutely and directly help the production in countless ways. This month's supporters include Salish Sea Sirens and Sprulus Minis, as well as Catherine, Christopher, Clarence, Ed, Gordon... Landon and Marion from Miscellaneous Magic. Thank you so much for your support. We also want to thank Paris, Rob, James, Kevin, Robert, Seth, Stephen, Trenton, Randy, and last but not least, Jake with Ghostly Activities. Please know that your Patreon support really does keep the spooky lights flickering in the parlor for Odd Tonic. Would you like to support the show and hear your name, nickname, business name, or (laughs) favorite pet called out in a thank you on Odd Tonic? Head on over to Patreon and check out this and other fantastic reward options. You can find us at patreon.com slash Odd Tonic. Now let's return for more credible, creepy confessions. Welcome back. So far, we've learned that medical intake forms don't have enough checkboxes to include the paranormal. (laughs) And when it comes to inhabiting a body, one spirit's company, two's a crowd. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to check in with one last person who submitted a story in November from Parlor Stories Past Life Edition. You may remember Gina, who, as well as having her own abilities, told us of her friend's five-year-old son who sees dead people. (laughs) Gina promised to follow up with another tale. And did she ever. (laughs) So, cradle that warm teacup and nestle in, dear guest. Here we go. I have always seen, known, or dreamt of things that freak most people out. My mom would tell me I was just more in tune because I'm an old soul. All my life, I have attracted those in tune with or those of the spiritual world. I don't share a lot of what has occurred over the years because I don't want to upset those around me. Let's just say, after going through the experience I'm about to share, my husband and his parents believe me. This all began in the fall of 2013. 
My husband and I were living out in the country, on the backside of a national park, and my daily drive was over an hour each way. I was always driving home late in the evening, and, it being autumn, once you got away from the lights of the city, there was nothing but moonlight to drive by through deer country. I had migraines since I was very little and have had strange episodes of vertigo off and on since I was a teen. Around this time, the episodes were becoming dangerously more frequent, to the point of having to stop on the side of the road until I could drive again. It had become almost a daily occurrence, and that's when I started seeing something very odd. On the road the house was on, there was a combination of fields, woods, and turnouts where hunters parked to chase game. As I was slowly rounding a particularly sharp curve of the road one evening, the headlights flashed on a man standing in one of the turnouts. It was not a totally unexpected scene, so I ignored it. It wasn't until the second flash of the headlights that I realized it was a farmhand, not a hunter. Still, not terribly unusual, so I let it go and drove on home. A few evenings later, I saw him again. He was closer to the road. His expression was calm, almost solemn-looking. Then it hit me. His clothes were wrong. The hat, the style of shirt, even the boots just didn't look right. They were very old and the colors were muted, almost gray, and I got that little shiver of acknowledgement. But once again, just kept driving. Yeah, I was definitely not stopping. His appearance started happening more and more often. Each subsequent time was closer to the last until I started seeing him every night. But he started showing up in different areas on my drive and farther away from my home. The more I saw him, the more it scared me because it seemed to coincide with my ability to drive. My health was becoming progressively worse. Migraines were coming on more quickly with a lot of strong auras like tunnel or rainbow vision. I was experiencing numbness on my right side, severe pain in my neck and back. The vertigo symptoms were increasing. My head would spin and swirl at any given moment. I kept wondering if he was somehow messing with me, but as I mentioned, talking to anyone about him would either scare them or make them think I was crazy. One particular night was really scary. My head was pounding and I felt so dizzy. My eyes went blurry. I don't know what happened, but I remember startling like I was waking up and I jerked the steering wheel. In the flash of my headlights... There he was, in the field to my left. I was almost five miles from home, the farthest I had ever seen him. I probably did the stupidest thing ever and stomped on the gas. Doing 65 on a hilly, winding road surrounded by deer country when your head is messed up is just plain dumb. But I was terrified. I just wanted to make it home. He followed me. I saw him in my rearview mirror. He was at the top of the hill my car had just crossed, standing in the middle of the road. I glanced at the mirror again. He was standing in the road again, but closer to my car. I looked back numerous times, and each time he was closer and closer to the red of my taillights until he was chest high to the back of the car. By the time I got to the road my house was on, I could see a soft, gray-blue glow out of the corner of my eye. He was beside the moving car, looking right at me through the passenger side window. His face, lit like an aura in the darkness, flashed in and out of view. I took the curve where I originally saw him way too fast, and he was suddenly sitting in my passenger seat. I screamed in terror. And then I was in the driveway of my home. What just happened? I absolutely should have flipped the car as hard as I took that turn. 
it's not humanly possible to take that curve at more than 10, 15 miles per hour, and there would still be a chance of rolling it. I had no clue how I got there. I sat in the still-running car for so long, I was still there when my husband arrived home from work, and he helped me into the house. The next day, we called the neurologist, and testing started. It wasn't but a month or so later that I was diagnosed with a rare disorder called pseudotumor cerebri and told I needed brain surgery. At this point, I had told no one except my husband of the farmhand and started wondering if he had been all in my head. We were on the way back from that initial appointment in the middle of the afternoon with my husband driving when I saw the farmhand again, standing in the same field from the scary night. I yelled for my husband to slow down, and I stared at the man. In the light of day, I could now see there was a small, fenced-in family cemetery just to the left of where he was standing. He stood smiling at me. He was so gray, almost pale, except for dark hair and eyes. He disappeared as we drove on. My husband didn't see him at all. Shortly after, we moved closer to the hospital, and after the brain surgery, I never saw the farmhand again. I'm sure you're thinking, this is pretty wild, but this story has a double whammy. You may remember the five-year-old boy I've spoken of before, the one who is sensitive in his own right. Last summer, his mom was renovating an old house, and my husband and I were there to help. While his mom and my husband worked, Little man and I played in the sand, out back. As is typical with our conversations, he started talking to me about other people. He was rooming his favorite train around and then rocketed it into the air. Nonchalantly, he said to me, You know, he didn't mean to scare you. Seriously confused, my skin started crawling. Who? I asked. The farmhand, he said. I was totally surprised. You know the farmhand? Yep. Not even looking at me, he continued to fly the train in circles. He wanted to help you. I was in shock. He says you were too sick to be on the road, and he wanted to make sure you got home safe, the child continued. He's sorry he scared you, and he's glad you're better now. Then the boy dropped the train, got up, and ran inside the house, leaving me dumbfounded. That happened before he was born, before I even knew his mother. The farmhand saved my life. I still don't know his name, but I know where he rests. I wanted to go find him, but my father-in-law warned me that his family would not appreciate me going into their family plot. So all I can do is thank him here and thank little man for letting me know. Mm-hmm. See, I told you it was a good one. <laughs> yes. I just love the layers. Mm-hmm. Was the ghost causing the health problems? Was he an omen of death? Was he a watchdog? I loved the mystery of the first half. Yeah, and that's the inherent problem with ghosts, right? Most of them do don't hold up a poster board saying, I'm here to help. (laughs) So no matter what, they scare the bloomers off of you. I blame Hollywood. (laughs) I also loved the twist at the end Mm -hmm. with the little boy. Such a narrative payoff. And I guess he was the ghost's poster boy in this case. (laughs) (laughs) Well, where was he before? (laughs) I'll bet he can tell you. (laughs) Well, as I've said before, And I'll say again, the wide spectrum of stories that we've received over the last year just confounds and delights me. So true. I've never heard a tale quite like this. And, you know, it boggles my mind to know that there are probably thousands Mm -hmm. out there that people are just sitting on, that they're just too nervous to tell. Oh, and that is a perfect segue into our next story, my love. Our last account comes to us from Laura, a listener who is sharing a story with us for the very first time. Welcome, Laura. (laughs) You've just earned your ghost storyteller merit badge. (laughs) (laughs) 
The story I'm about to tell happened to me around the age of seven years old. I have only told a few people in my life. I've always felt like people wouldn't believe me or would brush me off as just being a child making up a story. I am now 25 and have experienced many things that I could probably find a scientific explanation for. This instance, however, has stuck with me my whole life, and to this day, I can find no logical explanation for what happened. I'll begin with a little backstory. My mother and I lived in Mobile, Alabama for about three years after she and my father divorced. My mother worked very hard to provide for us. She would often be up for work before sunrise and would not get off of work until dark. She met someone during that time who is now my stepfather of 15 years. My stepfather and she began dating and we formed a relationship with the rest of his family. The summer before second grade, my mom would take me to my step-grandparents' house every morning on her way to work, where I would stay for the day. They lived in a small brick house in a suburban neighborhood, nothing out of the ordinary. Many years previous, my step-grandparents had lost a daughter named Renee to a rare disease when she was five years old. My stepfather told me that after Renee passed, his mother became very spiritual. She would perform seances to try to contact her daughter to the point of obsession. He also said that once, after a seance, his brother saw the little girl's ghost standing in their bedroom. The house I stayed in was not the house that my stepfather and uncle had lived in as children, but for some reason, I never liked it. The house was always cold and dark, even in the blazing hot summers. It just had a vibe about it that I didn't like. My step-grandmother kept items around the house that were her daughter's, like the clothes that she passed in, and a large painting of her. She talked of the girl sometimes and said that she still talked to her and saw her. Why she was telling a six-year-old this, I have no idea, but it scared the heck out of me. So life went on as normal that summer. My mom would drop me off early in the morning, get me settled on the living room couch to go back to sleep, and then leave to go to work. My step-grandmother would usually still be sleeping when I arrived, and my step-grandfather would already be at work. During the day, I would play outside with the neighborhood kids until my mom came and picked me up. The one thing that I always hated about the mornings is how cold it would be in the house, so I would always have my mom pile blankets on me when she tucked me in on the couch. One morning, after she dropped me off, I laid awake for a long time, unable to sleep. The house was dead silent except for the ticking of an old grandfather clock. Even though there was a little daylight coming through the windows, for some reason, I felt a little frightened, like I wasn't alone. All of a sudden, I heard the back door of the house slowly open and close. This was just one wall away from where I was lying. No one would have been visiting at this time of the morning, and the only thing I could think of was that my step-grandfather had come back home for something. The odd thing was, after the door closed, I heard nothing. I was frightened and laid very quietly, trying not to make any noise. Suddenly, I began to hear loud, slow footsteps coming through the kitchen toward the living room. I pulled the covers up to where I could barely peek out. I can't even explain the sudden dread and fear that I felt. The footsteps continued past me toward the hallway. When I dared to look at who was entering the hallway, there was absolutely nothing there. The footsteps stopped soon after I looked. And then that was it. Silence. I was terrified 
and lay there for what seemed like forever with my heart pounding until I finally fell asleep. When I awoke to my step-grandmother entering the kitchen, I told her what happened. I asked if my step-grandfather had returned home, thinking I had missed him walking through the living room. She replied, No, it was probably just Renee visiting. This was the last summer I stayed with my step-grandmother and was happy to go back to school after that. My parents, husband, and I both have homes in North Alabama, and we don't see this part of the family often. I still often think of this experience and the fear that I felt. It is the most real paranormal phenomena I have experienced, and I will never forget it. My theory is that my grandmother's persistence in communicating with her deceased daughter opened a door for something, but I don't think it was Renee. The presence I felt that day wasn't anything good, and nothing that I ever want to meet again. <laughs> That's a good one. Thank you, Laura. <sighs> Do you think the spirit was really Renee or was Grandma so desperate for contact she was letting anything in? Yeah. Because spirits, they don't wear name tags, even... <laughs> When they tell you they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm going to trust Laura's instincts mm -hmm. and vote she was letting other things yeah. in. The description of the vibe inside the house suggests that too, right? All right. Yeah. I don't mean harsh on her step-grandmother's life choices, but... <laughs> yeah. I understand her grief, most mm -hmm. certainly. Yeah. But her inability to heal seems to have led to something more complex. Yeah. Is therapy cheaper than an exorcism? <laughs> and there's another layer to it. Hmm. Say you do conjure a past loved one and they hang around for years. Hmm. What if time actually does allow you to grieve and move on? Then then what do you do? Do do you kick out the ghosts? <laughs> do you have to say yeah. goodbye to them a second time? Does yeah. that reopen the grieving process? How does that all work? <laughs> we know how that works. We read Pet Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I actually think Pet Cemetery was the first novel I ever read in fourth grade. Oh, my. <laughs> well, my dear Jennifer. That explains a lot, my love. <laughs> <laughs> I accept that. <laughs> Well, that wraps up this edition of Odd Tonic. We hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have a personal, true paranormal story, don't keep it a secret. Mm -mm. Share it with us. Email it to theparlor at oddtonicsociety.com. And again, you can spell power with a U or not. Mm -hmm. But if you like what you hear, please write Odd Tonic a kind review on your Apple Podcasts app, podchaser.com, Stitcher, CastBox, or iHeartRadio, so your fellow oddlings can find us too. Visit us on YouTube, Facebook, and all the socials, and we'll return again soon with more weird history, strange science, and paranormal peculiarities. This is, dear guest, goodbye for now. But remember, if you ever find yourself driving late at night on a dark forested road, and in your rearview mirror, you spy two figures at the back of your car, their faces eerily red in the glow of your taillights. Don't worry. It's just us. Good night. <laughs>